Part One. Listen to the conversation between a doctor's secretary and Mr. Jones, who wants to make an appointment with the doctor. Now look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Doctor Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. Okay. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones, Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. By the way, my name's Rebecca. I'm Doctor Ritter's secretary. Have you seen Doctor Ritter before, Mister Jones? Actually, no, Rebecca. We've only just moved to Los Angeles two days ago. Great. Welcome to LA, Mr. Jones. Thank you. When would you like to come in? Any time this week would be fine. I don't have to go into office until next Monday. Okay. Let me see. But first, to see how long you'll need, could you tell me why you need the medical? My insurance company needs it, and my companies were in real estate. Medical insurance also wants me to have one. Kind of killing two birds with one stone. Sure is. Insurance companies want a fairly complete examination, so that means you'll have to come in the morning and don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before. No problem. Let me see. Would 9 a.m. Thursday be convenient? 9 a.m. Thursday. No problem. Oh, I forgot. We have a meeting with my children's new headmaster that morning. That's at eleven. Look at question six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between the secretary and Mr. Jones. Then answer questions six to ten. What school is that? Beverly Hills High School. Oh, that's no problem. The whole examination will take about an hour, maybe a bit more, and the school is only two blocks from here—a three-minute walk. So you'll have plenty of time. That's good. So 9 a.m. Thursday. You got it. Now to save time when you get here, I'll ask you a few questions. Far away. First, what is your personal medical insurance company, Mr. Jones? Blue Cross. Blue Cross. And how old are you? Forty-six today. Happy birthday! Having a big party? Not really. We don't know anybody here yet, except for two neighbours. I think my family planned to take me out to dinner. A secret surprise, hey? Okay, back to Blue Cross. I'm just checking what they need. Let's see. Blood pressure, standard blood and urine tests, cholesterol levels, ECG, checking for diabetes, heart disease, the usual things. Do you have a medical condition at the moment, Mr. Jones? None at all. Touchwood, fit as a fiddle. That's great. I'm sure you'll stay that way. And do you know the name of your company's health plan? Yes, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is, the Kaiser Health Insurance Company. Kaiser, yes. They need the same information as Blue Cross, so as you said, killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And can I have your telephone number, Mr. Jones? Sure. My cell phone is one three eight zero five five six seven two one. One three eight zero five five six seven two one. Right. And my home number is area code eight zero five five two three zero two nine six. Eight zero five five two three zero two nine six. And do you have email? Yes, the address is pjones12 at hotspot dot com. Pjones12 at hotspot dot com. That's it. Well, that's all I need for now. See you Thursday, Mr. Jones. Sure thing, Rebecca. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an introduction to a group tour to Australia by a travel company manager. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Morning Sun Travel. I'm Rick Smith, and I manage our group tours to Australia, New Zealand, and the South Sea Islands. It's good to see so many of you here. As you know, I'm going to introduce our latest product, the Twenty One Day Grand Australian Tour. First of all, why did we develop this new tour? Well, our two-week Aussie tours have proved really popular over the past few years. So, after doing some market research, we found that there's a demand for a longer tour. In fact, looking around, I see some faces I recognise. You two went on our Australian tour last year, right? Great. Good to see you back again. If you think I'm exaggerating about Australia, you can interrupt me. Another thing. It's a long way from England to Australia, and many of our clients think it's a pity to go all that way for just a couple of weeks. So, our first three-week tour will head off in early November, about three months from now. Now, if we dim the light a bit, I'll show you some slides of what we'll do and see down under. Our first stop will be Sydney. It's one of my favourite cities. And we'll arrive mid-morning and check into one of my favourite hotels, the Five Seasons Hotel, Sydney. America's most popular travel magazine selected it as the best hotel in Australia. Believe me, it deserves every one of its five stars. It has fantastic views of Sydney Harbour, the famous Opera House, and Sydney Harbour Bridge. And for those of you who were born to shop, it's just a short walk away from Sydney's major shopping and business districts. Great restaurants and bars, and for those of us who like to keep fit, there's a state-of-the-art spa and fitness centre with sauna and heated outdoor pool. We'll have lunch in the hotel, and then off we'll go to explore. No time for a rest. To get over jet lag, it's best to get out and do something energetic. Our first afternoon, we'll stroll around the harbour and visit the Sydney Opera House. Then we'll have a relaxed evening. Dining at Luigi's Place, one of the city's best Italian restaurants. Day two, lots of fresh air. We'll have a day trip to the Blue Mountains. Just look at these slides. Wonderful views, complete with a walk through temperate rainforests. And these pictures are Featherdale Wildlife Park, the best wildlife park in Sydney, where you can feed kangaroos, have your photo taken with koala bears. And see over two thousand different other types of Australian animals, including crocodiles, Tasmanian devils, wombats. Look at this picture of a wombat. Looks like a bear with short legs. And penguins, dingoes, and snakes. Lots of snakes. Some of Australia's snakes are the most poisonous in the world. And you can also learn about Aboriginal culture. And this is fun. Try throwing a boomerang. Look at questions sixteen to twenty. And look at these slides: Australia's Grand Canyon, the Megalong and Jamison Valleys. Incredible. On the way back, we'll get in our bus and stop at the Sydney 2000 Olympic site, where you can see Stadium Australia, the Superdome, the Aquatic Centre, the Olympic Village, and lots more. So, day two, great day. But that's not all. After that, we'll take a cruise down the Parramatta River. 
under the Sydney Harbour Bridge and into Sydney Harbour. Any questions so far? OK, let's see what we'll be doing on day three. Anyone flown in a seaplane? Just a few of you. Well, a visit to Sydney would not be complete without viewing the world-famous Bondi Beach from 500 feet in the air, and this is a picture of Bondi Beach. We take off from Rose Bay, which is not far from our hotel. This should be a slide of Rose Bay. Yes, it is. You can see the seaplane taking off. Then we fly down the coast to Bondi Beach. Look at that surf. Returning back up the coast, we fly over Manly and Long Reef before returning to the harbour. Climbing to a height of 1,000 feet for a vista of Sydney Harbour, which will take your breath away. Look at this slide. And this one. Wow! And then back to Rose Bay. Then it'll be time for lunch in Chinatown. That's a great thing about Australia. It's a country of immigrants, so in the cities you can get just about any food you like. Greek, Chinese, Mexican, you name it. And perhaps you'd like to try kangaroo meat, very low fat. And after a big lunch, we'll go to walk it off in Luna Park. I can't begin to tell you how much there is to see and do here. We'll just run through a few slides. Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say to give you an idea. Hey, I see the coffee's here. It's a bit early, not to worry. Let's all grab a cup now, and then we'll move on to Melbourne, then the Great Barrier Reef, and all the other great places on the itinerary. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Listen to the conversation between Bill and Dan, two students who are discussing the talks they have to present to their social psychology class. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Anne. How's it going? I'm going mad. I haven't even started preparing my talk for tomorrow's political science class. Me neither. I've been so busy looking after my mum. She's still ill? Yeah. The doctor says I should get someone to do all her cooking and cleaning for another week or so, but we can't afford to employ someone to help her. The neighbours are all too busy. It's not that I'm too busy with my other classes. That's really tough. I've got no excuses for not being prepared. Too much time playing computer games. Now, how many times have I told you? I know, I know, but at least I've got a topic. Which is? Well, it's about an experiment in Los Angeles, I think, that I read about in social studies at high school. It's about how wearing a uniform can change people's personalities. This professor got a lot of his students to agree to take part in an experiment during the summer vacation but he wouldn't tell them anything about it. As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30.
Can you remember the professor's name? No, but I think he was from the University of California at Los Angeles. Well, at least you've got the most important thing, a topic. I haven't even got that. So, what happened in this experiment? Well, the prof got the local police to cooperate. One night, they went to about twenty students and arrested them. Poor guys didn't have a clue what for. And they didn't know it was the experiment they had volunteered for. They had no idea, and it had been weeks since they volunteered for the experiment. Anyway, the cops took them to a school building that had been made to look like the inside of a prison or a police station. Can't remember. It's not important. And what happened then? Did they get charged or something? Don't know. They must have been told something, but that's not the main thing. Which was? Well, what they didn't know was that about eight other students were waiting at the police station, or whatever it was, dressed up as prison guards. Hey, now I think I read about that ages ago. The experiment took place in the early seventies, and the students dressed as prison guards were told to act like prison guards. I've just thought of something. Did the arrested students know the other students? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so. No, different schools. Because otherwise, the ones who thought they'd been arrested might have realised it was the experiment they had signed up for. Guess you're right. But then, what happened? Remember? Yeah, the guards really got into it and started treating the other guys like they see on the movies, making them do press ups, cutting their hair really short, not letting them sleep. A real power trip. The poor guys were terrified. Yeah, the experiment was supposed to last for a week, but things got out of control. Remember, the guys who thought they were prisoners, not guards, started having nervous breakdowns. Hey, look at the time. I gotta go. At least you've got something to talk about. How role playing can get real, especially when we put uniforms on. Yeah, and the students were normal, nice guys who didn't waste time with computer games. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about sales and marketing. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening, and welcome to the second class of our sales and marketing course. Tonight and in the next few weeks, I'll be talking about advertising. To be specific, about different types of advertising, different types of message, all of which, of course, are supposed to make your company or your organization, the government perhaps, more successful. Now, please note that I'm not at this stage going to talk about advertising media. There are various choices here: radio, newspapers, television, billboards, magazines, and of course the internet. It's almost impossible to go into Google or Yahoo or whatever and not find adverts on almost every page. But we'll talk about the various choices of media later. First, I will stress one thing: advertising can be expensive. Whether you are a small business, an NGO. Or a multinational corporation, so it's very important that what you spend on advertising is money well spent, money that achieves your objectives, whatever they might be. The ads must be cost-effective. It is therefore essential to use the right type of advertising with the right message that make it effective. There are several types of advertising. 
aiming to promote one, sometimes more, of the following things. Brand name, company image, a product, a service, rather than a product, or a group, like a manufacturer's association or a cooperative. Can you think of anything else? Right. You might want to make people look after their health better and associate your company with things that can help them do this. But the common aim is that the advertiser wants to change or reinforce people's attitudes and perceptions. And in most cases, their behavior, maybe their buying habits. Which type you choose depends on your objectives. All clear so far? Good. Okay, let's look at a very common type, advertising designed to promote a brand name. If you go out to buy many types of product, toothpaste, detergent, cheese, how many of you think of the name of the company that made it? Right, you don't usually think of Procter & Gamble when you buy the company's Tide laundry detergent or Cascade dishwashing powder or the Kraft Company when you buy Philadelphia cream cheese. That's right. Philadelphia cream cheese is a registered brand name. In fact, the name of the company, Kraft, is hardly noticeable on the package. The point is that these companies have successfully promoted the name of various products, and consumers buy these products primarily because they recognize the brand name and may not even know the name of the company that makes it. So, advertising to promote a brand name is designed to create and keep strong image in the customer's mind of the product, not the company. For example, would you buy Shell? You know, the big oil company. Would you buy Shell beer? It's a famous company, but probably not. Imagine. But what if Shell had bought a brewery and marketed a beer they called Granddad's Old Ale? You can bet that the word Shell Oil Company would be in the smallest print possible and would never be mentioned in Granddad's Old Ale advertising. But when you buy a can of Shell Oil or some gasoline, the word Shell is big and everywhere. So there is nothing better than a good brand name. Now, let's look at another type of advertising. Advertising that is designed to promote a company image. Imagine you've started a new company. You might want to start by getting the company name known first, before you worry about advertising your products and services. One company that did this was in San Francisco, the San Fran Video Store. The managers decided to promote the company name rather than promote the videos they rented out. They put small ads in local newspapers that simply said, San Fran Video Store, a great selection of movies. And they also had people handing out little cards with the same message on them, plus a list of the store locations. So they didn't spend a fortune on advertising. They put most of their money into making sure they had a great selection of movies. And it worked. They started with four stores in 1995, and now they have, at last count, 27. Now, can you think of examples of companies advertising both a product and the company name in the same advert? Come on, you must be able to think of one. What? That's right, a good example. Makers of luxury things like perfume and fashion. For example, when Chanel brings out a new perfume, the advertising message is always something like, Nightlight by Chanel. This almost immediately gives the new perfume a good reputation because it's by Chanel, and also reinforces perception of the company name. So, the different types of advertising might not be mutually exclusive. The important thing is that the objectives must be clear, mutually supportive, and not contradictory. Another type of advertising is designed to promote a service rather than a physical product. But our time is up, so we'll leave that till next time. Good night, everybody. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.